Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first UM Alumni Virtual Engagement Event. This is the beginning of a new series of events designed to keep you engaged with and informed about the great things going on at UM. My name is Jed Liston, and I have the honor of serving as the Alumni Director here at the University of Montana. This event is being brought to you today by the Office of Alumni Relations and the University of Montana Alumni Association. It's only fitting today that our inaugural conversation begins with an individual who has amazing discussions with the coolest people in Montana every week. It is my pleasure to introduce you to UM marketing professor and creator and host of a New Angle podcast, which recently celebrated its 100th episode, Justin Angle. Good afternoon, Justin. Hey, Jed, how are you? I'm well. Tell us how the podcast got started. Yeah, so the podcast started um, as a as a way to deliver better content to students. I was developing an online version of one of our marketing classes. Uh, we had made the decision as a college that this particular class should go online. And I sort of was scanning the ways online was being done and um, wasn't too into the video idea. Um, it seemed like it, it's a hard space to compete in without doing it really, really well and having a ton of resources. But also, video tethers somebody to a screen, and I had been using other podcasts as assignments in place of readings with really good results with students. And so I started thinking that a podcast might be a, a useful way to, to, to teach, to create content for my class. So I started interviewing people that were experts in particular domains to string together a set of 12 conversations to use for this class. As I was doing these conversations, it occurred to me that, um, one, this is really fun, learning people's stories, hearing about how they approach their work, and two, that it could probably serve a broader audience, and three, that at the time, the university wasn't doing an awesome job getting its positive stories out there. And so it felt like, hey, why not launch this thing and, and, and see what happens? And I, I borrowed a microphone from a retiring colleague, started having co conversations in my office, and it started to gain some momentum. And you know, here we are two and a half years later, and however many episodes in, um, it's been super fun. And we'd like to invite uh, all of our viewers to submit questions, and we'll uh, uh, give them to Justin. Um, Justin, uh, Tell us about some of the guests that you've had. As some people tuning in may not be avid listeners of your podcast. We're hoping that they will be after this. Uh -huh. Yeah, the guests kind of broadly fall into three categories. You know, one were, were university communities. So oftentimes there are amazing people coming through campus um, to speak. Uh, you know, we have the presidential lecture series folks. Like I got to uh, interview Winona LaDuke last year. Um, Cheryl Strayed last year. So yeah, we get access to some of these incredible people that come through campus. Larry Summers being another, the, the list of Maureen Dowd, the list is really impressive to me. And I think something about our size, this university is prominent enough to attract a lot of incredible people to its campus. We're situated in such a beautiful place too, where a lot of prominent people want to be in Montana. And you know, if we were in a big city, like if this was the University of Washington, I don't think I'd get access to those people. Like a Larry Summers comes through town, he's not gonna be talking to me, he's gonna like go talk to Bill Gates next. Um, so I think our size enables uh, that sort of access. The other category are people in this community that are doing awesome things, whether it's an entrepreneur coming up with a cool idea, somebody who's uh, an activist or a leader, or somebody else doing something to create value in the community. Missoula is such a vibrant, plays, artists, musicians, etc. And then we have all the great people on campus, faculty, staff, students, uh, and that's another category of guests. You know, when you start a thing like this, um, you, know, you sort of have to approach it like you want to do this every Tuesday for the rest of your life. It's sort of like a blog. You gotta, you, the worst thing you can do with a, something like this is do a couple episodes and then peter out. Um, and there's been no shortage of awesome people to talk to. So that's that's made the project, that's like the easiest part of the project, finding cool guests to talk to and learn from. Okay, we uh, asked some of our uh, alumni who uh, we sent this notice to, to submit questions beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna read some of, uh, some of those. Um, 
personally, for you, who has been your most inspiring interview? Now, this could be dicey if you, you know, call out or don't call out some of your colleagues. But for you, personally, who's been your most inspiring interview? Oh, gosh. I mean, it's, it's hard to pick one. Um, talk about some inspiring moments. How about that? Mm -hmm. um, the first real, like, moment of just electric energy was the... the We've had Jeff Amet from Pearl Jam on twice, but he was he came on very early, and he was an early kind of aspirant guest that I was trying to to to, to entice to come on, and he was super generous and, and came on. And when he was talking about the creative process within the band Pearl Jam, you could just see this energy in him. And I was talking to him about like what's the difference between a solo song that he writes and a song that becomes a Pearl Jam song? Because all those guys at this stage of their musical careers, they have other side projects and collaborations and so forth. But to see, you could just sense in him like how important and special it is when a song that he creates and writes becomes a Pearl Jam song. Um, yeah, you could just get a little bit of a glimpse into the magic that that band has been able to capture for over the years. Um, I'd say beyond that inspiration comes in the conversations that I've been really pushed to learn and you know I had a conversation last year with a journalist Anne Helen Peterson she writes for BuzzFeed she uh, lives here in Missoula she's done some incredible work on uh, millennial burnout and how it affects uh, different categories of people differently uh, that really pushed my thinking and opened my mind um, the interview with Winona LaDuke was really powerful when she came to campus um, to understand kind of the, the, the passion and perspective she brings to her advocacy work. Um, yeah, so many others. I mean, they're, they're all inspiring. It's hard to, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, yeah. Is that a cop out, Jed, that I didn't pick one? No, it's probably a safety uh, yeah, a net bit, there. A little bit. So, Justin, you've talked to a lot of Missoula business people, mm -hmm. and you've uh, you've had several people, Grant Cure, many people who are uh, ingrained in the Missoula community. One of our questioners say, "What do you what do you see as the biggest advantage to a company looking to move and succeed in Missoula? And in your opinion, talking to these folks, what type of company would instantly thrive there?" Yeah, uh, so I guess I'll take the first part first. The, the, the theme that has emerged to me is one of sort of diversity, acceptance, and community. You know, early on, we did an episode with Matt McQuilkin, who's co-founder of Black Coffee. And he was talking about this, something about the community of entrepreneurs here in Missoula. And they all, you know, it's a competitive marketplace, but also it's a collaborative marketplace. People celebrate the success of others and, and they want the tide to rise for everyone. And so that, that permeates, I think, the, uh, the local economy. There's a real community spirit and we're thoughtful with going through this process right now. I mean, COVID-19 notwithstanding, but there's a thoughtful process of how this community should approach growth and the attributes that um, strengths that people want to preserve as the community grows. Um, as far as why would you look, is that, was that the second part of the question? Yeah, it's a, what type of com company do you think would instantly thrive here? Anybody that wants people that are willing to work hard, uh, maybe do so a little bit anonymously um, with some humility. And, um, you know, like there's so many underground crushers in this town that are just doing awesome work and they don't really care if they get the accolades or not. Um, so yeah, hard motivated workforce, a workforce that um, is really committed to the place and likes balance in their lives. Um, you know, a lot of companies might not be, you know, they sort of quantify work product in terms of hours. Uh, we got people here that get an incredible amount of work done, but they still have great balance in their lives. And I think that makes their lives richer and better and it makes a community better. Um, so, yeah, anybody that wants just good people willing to work hard, which sounds pretty universal as, as, as I lay it there, but I, you know, I think there's great talent coming out of the university, more and more programs that are being built to enable people to walk into jobs right away at a lot of these great companies that are either being built here 
the entrepreneurial initiatives or choosing to locate here because of the great things happening. We have an online question from Josh. Justin, how do you think COVID will change the landscape of business and marketing? What do you think the new normal will be? Mm. Well, I'm hesitant to make any predictions. I sort of feel like anybody that's making predictions right now is, um, you know, but well, anyway, <laughs> you asked me to make predictions. Um, I think the way I'm thinking about COVID-19 is, is as an accelerant. It's accelerating a lot of things that were already happening in our society or already existing. So if you look at education, I think of this just with my kids and my students, right? Um, COVID-19 is an accelerant of inequality in education. If, if you were one of those students that sort of really needed structure and really needed the teacher to be on you to get your work done, and, or if you were a self-starter and were a little bit easier to deal with autonomy, like the differences in outcomes for those sorts of students, I think are gonna be wide. And the students that are in families, and I'm talking mostly about like homeschool kids right now, high school students, elementary school students, um, Kids are in families that place a high value on education and invest and have the time and resources to, to, to spend time helping their students. Those families are gonna develop an even bigger gap to the families that might not have that luxury or haven't had the history of placing that value on education. And it's gonna be an accelerant in other dimensions as well. Right now, like as we're sort of maybe easing back to work, the people that can get back to work that are fortunate enough to be in those jobs or have the resources or are healthy enough that they can take a little bit more risk, they're gonna have an advantage because they can go back to their work, they can be hired, etc. cetera. Um, it's an accelerant in terms of a lot of technology. A lot of companies I think are gonna be rethinking travel in the short term and the long term, uh, other ways of communicating, other ways of maybe getting the job done with less cost, but also um, less investment. And yeah, I just sort of view it as the world is, um, it's never gonna be more the same. You know, it's kind of a way I think about it. Okay, sort of uh, paralleling that, but uh, again, putting on your, your futurist hat, um, uh, uh, one of our viewers wrote, in your opinion, what is Montana's next big thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's happening, right? I think we are, you know, the, the state is wrestling with its history of, you know, natural resource extraction to move toward a tourism industry. I mean, that tourism industry is long and storied, but, but I don't think the move is quite that simple. It's not an either or, and, and you're seeing this upswell of entrepreneurial initiatives, particularly in the technology space. You look locally at like Luminad, Submittable, ClassPass, Onyx Maps, these incredibly interesting companies, and that's just here in Missoula. They have interesting ideas. They realize they have this hungry workforce that the university is preparing well to walk into these jobs and succeed. People that want to stay here. Um, so I think the next big thing, big thing are, are these, these technology startups that um, can employ people prepared to do the work, but also people that have a deep appreciation for the place. So that's my hope, and, and that we can continue to keep this a special place. This one goes along with that a little bit. Um, you've interviewed many people from Montana companies. Have you ever finished a podcast and said, man, I've got to invest in or join that outfit? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm fairly risk averse, like, a, and I'm not super liquid <laughs> as far as <laughs> being able to put money behind things. But um, there's one company in particular that was so inspiring, um, and that's Reflex Protect. Um, a guy by the name of Joe Anderson is the fellow I know, his, his partner I, I haven't met. But um, we interviewed Joe, I don't know, maybe a year ago. Reflex Protect makes a non lethal self display a self-defense spray and it's basically a, a, a gel form of tear gas in a, a bottle that kind of has a trigger so it's pretty intuitive and it's a solution to a really what previously has been an intractable problem in our society do we you know there's this huge debate about guns in schools people 
on one side say, oh yeah, we gotta get the teachers guns. And the other people on the other side say, we don't want guns anywhere near a school. But what they share is a desire to keep their children safe. And so a product, a product like the Reflex Protect um, system arrives and it immediately cuts through that intractable difference of opinion between these groups. And they realize, here's a solution that meets both of our goals and we can agree on this. And then once they realize they can agree, like so many other things are possible. So that particular product, one, it was just such a brilliant idea, but it also showed that innovation is possible in a lot of these areas where we think we're just at a, at a stalemate as a, as a society. And there, Missoula Company, over in Montec right now, um, actually going through a round of, uh, like a, a, not quite a Kickstarter, it's through a, it's through a platform called Republic. So if you're interested, Reflex Protect through their Republic campaign, not to shill for uh, a podcast uh, um, guest, but I think they're doing an awesome job and it worth checking out. Great. One person writes, uh, they, they say, I'm an 88 grad of the business school. That's back when it was a school, not a college. You're a bit younger than, than me, but how would you compare your current UM students to business students in your day? Mm. And then uh, she has a follow-up to that as well. So, Well, I mean, my undergraduate institution was a little different uh, in the sense that like everybody I went to, to school with wanted to go to Wall Street. And that was kind of just the model there. I went to school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and that was sort of a feeder to Wall Street. And, and we don't really have that kind of feeder mentality here. Um, we do have some students that, that uh, want to leave Montana, but in my experience, most want to stay here. They want to build their lives here. Um, you know, I don't know if this is generational, if I can attribute it to back in my day versus right now. The students here, I think, have uh, this deep, innate work ethic that they might be a little green in terms of, you know, haven't been exposed to as many things through their smaller town or, or high school or whatever, but um, they really were really willing and eager to work hard and uh, don't need a lot of direction, are able to work aut autonomously, reliably, and just don't put on airs. There's not a sense of entitlement, um, which I really find refreshing. Couple that with an important part of the culture here at the college and at the university is that we're a very flat structure. I mean, faculty members, staff, students, we all have meaningful relationships with one another and we're accessible and we place a, a deep value on that. And I think that helps um, you know, when you have students that are willing to come to the table and work hard and, and faculty want to sort of support and invest in that. So, um, you know, I kind of meandered around some aspects of the question, but I think that the, the connection between students and faculty and staff here is, um, is certainly different than what I experienced as a, as a student as an undergrad. This feeds right into that theme. The follow-up was, what do you think is the most compelling reason a student should select UM to study business? Well, I think what we're doing here at the College of Business is trying to connect your, your educational foundation with the demands of this concept called the future of work. How is technology going to shape the jobs of the future? Um, whether it's the forces of artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, um, asynchronous forms of communicate, all these different things are disrupting how work is done. And we are building a curriculum here in the college and at the university that's, that aims to meet that need. Um, and, and within that, there's this tension, right? We're trying to prepare students for performance on day one at a job so they can immediately start paying off their student loans or, or you know, be a contributing member of society, um, but also instill in them a lifelong interest in learning and the awareness that they're going to have to be interested in learning their whole life. Um, so that's the, the, being able to, well, we're an institution that's sort of intentionally trying to navigate that tension. And I think that's what, what sets us apart and provides value. Okay. Um, 
couple uh, questions that go back to the podcast themselves. This I, I do love this question just because it uses a very nice buzzword. You get to hang with really cool people for your podcasts. Have you ever gone fanboy over anybody or you're just unfazed generally? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that first interview with Jeff Ament. That was one where I was like, I think I did okay in the moment. Some of my closer friends that listened to it were like, you really just wanted to ask him about Eddie Vedder, didn't you? <laughs> Something like that. But um, I was buzzing for days after that one. That was pretty electric for me. Uh, meeting Tyler Hamilton early on, he was a hero of mine, you know, former professional cyclist, grew up not far from where I grew up in New England. So that was... A really fun one. Larry Summers was um, pretty impressive. Like Larry Summers is uh, brilliant. I mean, he's gotten into some trouble on a variety of things. He's, he's, he's gotten into some trouble with some comments about differences and different types of people, and it's cost him some jobs. But you, you can't uh, argue with the intellect, and he's also a presence, um, kind of a notorious presence, and so interacting with him. Yeah, that was that uh, was humbling in many ways. Like I just felt I didn't feel small. That wasn't not what I'm trying to convey, but I just felt like there was a real sense that that fella had been in some big, important meetings and had been part of some really important decisions for our country. Have you ever been in a uh, podcast situation where part way through you're thinking this wasn't such a good idea, or nope, nope, nope? Uh, yeah. You don't have to name names. Yeah, I won't name names. We've had a couple that didn't make it to air. Um, you know, they just either it didn't work out or the person I interviewed made a job change or a life change that sort of made the premise of the conversation inappropriate to get on the air. Um, other times, you know, there's been like maybe two times that I've given somebody a do-over. Um, and generally what we're trying to do is to celebrate people's work and you know not not being a shill for the university or sort of just trying to be a mouthpiece for anybody but we want to the general tone of the show is to be positive and to celebrate good work being done and so sometimes it just feels like yeah man this person didn't really was it we weren't really able to get the sense of what this person's about and their perspective on life and and what we wanted out of the talk and so in those instances we've done redos mm -hmm. yeah. But I think there's been, I mean, obviously I, I learn more in some than others and some are more inspiring than others, but I think all of them, there's something to learn from. You did a uh, sea change series uh, that uh, that reflected the university's yeah. uh, sea change program. And, and uh, one person wrote in and asked, um, what are your main takeaways from the sea change series? You, I, like, eight or nine podcasts, right? Twelve. Twelve. We had Twelve. Oh, um, basically, when Sea Change launched, I was speaking to Kelly Webster about, you know, is there something that the podcast can do to to help amplify the, the Sea Change initiative? And we came up with the idea of um, d dedicating an episode a month to Sea Change. So we did a series of 12. Um, and that was, I mean, I, I think one thing I learned through that process is um, I had some conflict about how to approach selecting guests and positioning those guests. There was risk that, you know, I've tried to the extent possible to cultivate diversity on as many dimensions as I can on this show, whether it's gender, whether it's field or ethnicity or political persuasion I've tried to do that now that's not that's not to say we can't do better we certainly can and we're trying um, but when you you throw on top of that something like sea change there was a risk that it could descend into oh yeah every month you have on a woman and that's your sea change episode and I did not want to do that nor should we do that so there was a risk of diminishing the sea change initiative in, in and of itself rather than amplifying it and what we tried to do was select voices and invite voices who had a unique story to tell with regard to gender equity and their experience. So 
So some of the things I learned were interesting is that um, there's some women who came on the show for whom the gender experience wasn't really on their radar. They describe themselves as the sort of person that just does their work and doesn't worry about gender inequity. And that was a tricky topic for me to try to interrogate. Um, you know, I wasn't, I didn't quite get to where that sense comes from. Um, another thing, and this is maybe controversial, and I don't know the scientific research on this, but the dimension of height also emerged as something I learned. Um, women who tend to be taller were less, uh, in their experiences, seemed less affected by gender inequity. That's just observation from conversations. I'm not citing any data. It's a controversial thing to say. I get that. But it just was this odd sense that, you know, one of the differences in gender is physical presence. And, you know, men often use their physical stature to, to intimidate or to, um, to persuade or whatever. And I think that, you know, women who, tend, who are taller sometimes can exert that same thing. Um, so that was one thing we explored a little bit with a couple of guests. I'm trying to think what else we learned. Um, I learned a lot about the history of women's suffrage. We had Anya Jabor on, Regents Professor of History, Anya Jabor. We started the podcast with Anya. Um, she's done some incredible work, um, focused recently on the history of Sophie Nispa Breckenridge, and that's a recent book about um, Sophie Nispa, who is this incredibly kind of lost to history figure that became this great champion for gender equality and, and suffrage, women's suffrage in particular. And so that's sort of where we started the uh, series and that's where we ended it with our final episode in March. I learned a lot about that history, which was, um, which was fascinating. And just sort of the study of history. I'm a business professor, I've taken a few history classes, but to learn, learn about how Anya approaches her work was, um, was really interesting. I will say too, I learned we had a student on. I wanted to get a student on. We had Kat Cowley, who's a Master's of Public Administration student. She's also one of the co founders of the Food Pantry here at the university. Really important program for students in need. And so, getting the student's perspective, and she pushed on the notion of sea change being why is it just to, why isn't it promoting, uh, why isn't it doing something to sort of deal with people who are gender, not deal with, but to elevate people who are non-binary in their gender that don't necessarily identify as male or, or female and and um, kind of push my thinking on some of those topics as well. I learned a lot from Kat and I appreciate her candor and, and passion on the podcast. That was a good episode. Good. Um, Kelly from online says, we hear a lot about UM alumni and the support they're offered while operating or opening businesses in Missoula and the state of Montana. Do you have any advice for alumni starting companies in other parts of the country? Are there any platforms for out-of-state entrepreneurs to communicate their needs or interests with you and business professor, professionals or fellow alumni? Well, I would say that we, you know, we have the Blackstone Launchpad, um, which I'm not sure if the, if the listener's familiar with Blackstone Launchpad, but it's, 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 it's situated on our campus, and it's a, a resource for anybody trying to bring an idea to life. And when I say anybody, I mean students, staff, faculty, and alumni. And I think that's a resource, though it does focus often on businesses in the, in the local area, but it's, as an alum, you're, you are welcome to consume that resource, and I encourage you to check that out. Uh, Paul Gladen, Morgan Slumberger, and their team do a fantastic job. And it could be a remote interaction where they help walk you through some exercises that, um, that really help articulate what your value proposition is and how you can bring that value, pro you know, how you can match that with a business model that makes sense. So I start there. And then, you know, as faculty, we really value experiential learning. And we try to create experiences in our classes that give students the chance to grapple with live problems. So feel free to reach out 
to me individually, and if there's if there's uh, opportunities to collaborate with a particular class, even remotely, uh, we're always game to do that. I've done plenty of those sorts of projects in my classes, and a lot of my colleagues do the same thing, and we really enjoy doing those sorts of things. Terrific. Thanks for the question, Kelly. You talked a little bit about research, and one of our questioners said they must have been looking you up, um, and said. You did some research on how native mascots reinforce aggressive stereotypes a few years back. Did that have any impacts on teams or communities? And are you planning any follow-up research? Yeah, um, I don't know the extent to which it influenced uh, any specific decisions that teams made. I will say the timing, we missed our moment a little bit. We released the study, I think, in I'm going to get the years wrong here, but the study came out in like some midsummer of 17 or something like that. And, and it kind of got picked up by the Washington Post. And they we didn't study the Washington football team, but uh, everybody asked. That was sort of the most prominent example of these mascots at the time, or at least the one captivating the media the most. And um, we got asked to speak to that issue a lot. We got picked up by the Washington Post and wrote a piece in the Post that got some traction. But we missed our moment because the following year, the World Series had the Cleveland Indians, and we had used the Cleveland Indians mascot. Like we'd study that particular imagery in our study. We'd done field studies in Cleveland. And I think at the time, it might have been the ALCS. I'm not getting this. I might be botching the history, but they played the Toronto Blue Jays. And I think the AL, the American League Championship Series. In Toronto, like before the series passed some legislation or an ordinance basically saying, like, you can't have the Indians, you can't have the Chief Wahoo logo in our town. And it it put the story on the, on the radar, and I feel like we could have weighed in on that more since our study was a little late for that. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I can't can't attribute any specific decision to our study, although it did get national coverage. We were in the post and it was part of a cover story in Sports Illustrated. So I think it contributed to a conversation that's ongoing and I think slowly moving, in, in my opinion, in the right direction. There's a lot of opinions about these things. I, I, think, I think we can do better than. And um, so they have a couple of questions for that and this might require a backstory, but. Okay. Um, this one is, UM had a crew team sporadically from 1996 to 2012. Would you like to resurrect it if we can find the boats? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so that might require a backstory of yeah, so how you got into rowing and crew. The backstory is, yeah, I, I rowed crew in college at the University of Pennsylvania. It's, uh, it was a big sport back there and a few places out west. Um, you know, when I say I majored in finance, I really majored in rowing. Uh, it was a big, big part of my life. It's how I met my wife. Um, and the first job out of college was as a bond trader. I did that for four years in San Francisco, but that allowed me afternoons. I was working New York hours, 4.30 in the morning till about 2.30 in the afternoon. And that allowed me afternoons to coach. I was coaching a high school crew. And after four years of doing that, decided I want to give this crew coaching thing a go. Went back to Penn, coached there, coached a little bit at Yale. So had that coaching in my background. It didn't, wasn't quite the dream career I thought it was going to be. Went to grad school, sort of landed on this professor career as sort of this through line between business experience and um, my interest in coaching and teaching and working with students trying to improve their lives. Um, fast forward to, I think it was like my first week or two here, Student shows up in my office, tells me about the crew team, tells me that they train up on, uh, um, which lake is it? Salmon Lake. I Salmon believe. Lake. Yep. Salmon Lake. Yeah, that we had. Yeah, and I had never been to Salmon Lake at that point. I mean, I was like, hadn't even lived here a month, and this fellow was saying, "Yeah, we practice at five in the morning up in Salmon Lake, and it's only a forty-five minute drive. And would you be interested in coaching?" So, you know, generally, like. My approach to new jobs is to say yes. I mean, generally my approach to my work is to say yes to things, provided they make the, 
reasonable sense. Um, but at that point, I'm like, God, I just got here. Never been to Salmon Lake. I got to make tenure. I got to get research out. I got to perform in the classroom. So I declined the invitation. Um, but there are times, man, where I miss that sport. Clark Fork is rarely glass calm, particularly this time of year. If, but when I see it that way, or I drive by Salmon Lake or other lakes, and you just see it glass calm, and yeah, you kind of get this energy of missing that sport. And I thought, man, that would be something to be out in the water again. So I don't know. Maybe that's the condition, right? You get yourself some boats, and, and maybe I'll show up. <laughs> How about that? Well, I'll probably need some oars, too, and some people to pull on those oars. Sure. Uh, the same person said one of their favorite moments uh, in that show is when your girls interview you on on that particular show, yeah. uh, and they just want to say, please have them do it again, and maybe Maggie interview you as well with a smiley face at, at the end of that. <laughs> it was a good moment. I had to go look, listen to that after this one came in, and it was a good moment where it, it appeared that maybe one of your girls was ready to tear down the equipment at that moment. Yeah, we've gotten there um, a lot of times when you do these things, you know, I schedule an interview and then I record an intro outro later. Um, and a lot of time, I mean, those are little bits of work that are often hard to fit in. And oftentimes they just like, they're happening on a weekend, like I'm editing on the weekend and I need to record something. And so I'll come in here and often want my daughters with me and I'll say, okay, you know, if you can be quiet for five minutes, I'm just gonna record for five minutes and then we'll go get ice cream or, you know, shameless use of sugar as a bribe. Um, but so yeah, when I can get them involved, that's been really fun. They love to kind of sing into the mics and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, we're also, we're doing this, uh, COVID-19 series right now. Um, every Friday, we're recording an episode, a conversation between me, Bryce Ward, who's an economist in town, um, Grant Keir, the executive director of the Missoula Economic Partnership, and Susan A. Patrick, who's CEO of United Way of Missoula. So on Fridays after, Friday afternoons, we've been recording a conversation. We bring in guests. I think we had President Bodnar on this week's episode. Actually, had President Bodnar post, posted on Monday. Um, I think this Friday we're speaking with Mayor John Engen, so he'll be on Monday's episode. Those episodes cover some heavy ground. I mean, the state of the affairs with the disease itself, public health information, the economy. Um, at the same time, the spirit of the show is kind of lighthearted. If you're a listener, you probably get that. Um, try to be respectful and understand the gravity of some of the topics we cover, but also just trying to have fun in our work. So I've been bringing in my daughters at the beginning of those episodes just for sort of like an update from our homeschooling routine. And some of those have been pretty funny as well. Well, I think any of our viewers who have been uh, Zoom bombed in meetings uh, by their children yeah. at these days and yeah. and everybody, I think, understands that uh, the, exactly what that moment was for you in that podcast. Oh, yeah. And great yeah. to have, <laughs> have have them along. So. Uh, there's another question that says, uh, is there anyone that you are dying to do a follow-up podcast, and why would you why would you say, call that? Is there anyone? Follow-up. Follow-up. Yeah. Um, let's see. I would like to have Winona LaDuke back on. We kind of took an hour to get to the assertion that capitalism is evil we probably just should have started there <laughs> you know we danced around it for a while and her contention was you know capitalism is a flawed system and we have to do better and I, I would have I, I think the conversation would have been um, would have people would have learned more from the conversation had we just started there uh, it was hard to start there we were getting to know each other and kind of I was finding my way with the interview, um, but yeah, to have her back and kind of dig into that, I think would be would be interesting. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, you know, at some point we had we had President Bodnar on. I think it was episode four or five, uh, pretty early in his time here. I think he had just started, and so it'd be it'd be interesting to. I mean, we had him on this week, but it was sort of crisis oriented. 
Um, but it'd be interesting to have him on, you know, a couple of years down the road from when he started to say, hey, you know, is this opportunity what you thought it would be? And have you been able to accomplish what you thought? And you know, how would you judge success and failure? And, and, and yeah, what's, what's the status update of, of where we're at as an institution? I think there's a lot of things to be excited about. And hopefully, you know, over the next few months, some of that will start to take some shape. Our uh, UM Alumni Network is vast, wide, with uh, connections everywhere. Yeah. Uh, over 100,000 uh, strong, and uh, many of them may be uh, watching this post and not live, but if you could have any guest mm. that you could have across the country or the world, probably, I won't make the living or dead thing, but, the, sure. but any guest now, who would it be, and maybe we'll make a plea to the <laughs> UM alumni community. Does anybody know this person, or, or several? Are there people that, you, the wish list, the bucket list of oh, guests? Well, I mean, there's there's like the luminaries, but, I mean, so we're watching that ESPN documentary, Last Dance, right now, and my kids know it's just like over the moon for Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. So I, like, my daughters are saying, you gotta get Michael Jordan on the podcast. I'm like, go, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Um, although Phil Jackson's a possibility because he's right up in Pulse. Montana, yeah. So you know, somebody could get us to Phil Jackson. That'd be pretty sweet. Um, outside of that, you know, uh, people with more local ties. I've um, I'd love to interview Colin Malloy, musician from Helena, who's come through the University of Montana. He's now you know with the Decemberists, lives in Portland. And that's a guy that we've tried to connect with. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to Jim Messina, prominent alum, who's done some work on the university's behalf. Um, I did try to get a conversation with John Krakauer. I think there's more to be said there and, and more, more questions to answer. And, and uh, we weren't successful in, in, in getting a yes from John, although that was when the Supreme Court case was still pending, so maybe it's time to circle back to that. I know he has spoken since the book came out in town, and um, you know, I'd like to, a lot of questions I have about that project and, and his other work. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the wish list right now, I think. Although, you know, this is, this is sort of a crowdsourcing endeavor, so people Give us your suggestions. Some of the best guests we've had are from listener suggestions. And so, yeah, please please keep them coming because um, that's been really, really helpful and I've met some awesome people through that. Yes, please submit on, on the comments if you can think of somebody, if you have contacts, or contact uh, Justin directly. That's right. Okay. All right, this is this is one that I, I love as well because I'm, I'm a fifth-generation Montanan and I grew up with this person. But... Uh, um, after listening to your podcast, I have a new respect for Charlie Beaton. Mm -hmm. I noticed that you may have missed the reference to VTO, which is his band's name. Yep. Uh, Charlie uh, is the proprietor, and ver we're very proud of uh, the Big Dipper. But his uh, his uh, band's name is Vi Thompson Overdrive. Now, uh, the writer says, you haven't been here long enough to know the societal impact of Vi Thompson. Mm -hmm. But have you had a chance to look up that Missoula treasure after the, the conversation? You know, I have when, when, you know, I was in that podcast with Charlie, and he came back on last week again. But um, as I do recall, he did tell me, yeah, VTO stands for Vi Thompson Overdrive, and he sort of said that Vi Thompson was this news anchor in town. And at the time, I thought, wow, that's, well, I mean, people make up band names for any kinds of silly reasons, so... You know, interesting. And then uh, it wasn't until you know we saw this question came in, and I I, I looked more closely at, at the history of Vi Thompson. What an incredible woman! Yeah. Um, just in this, this Montana institution on so many dimensions, it's so much more than just. I mean, not not just a news host, but yeah, the work on so many important issues to Montana. Um, I learned a lot, and it was so. Thank you for the question because it motivated me to really understand that case a little bit more. It's terrific. She was a pioneer, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. 
Well, I believe that that is uh, our question. That's a wrap. Uh, that's, okay. a, that's a wrap. I would like to uh, just close by thanking you, Justin, for you. participating in this inaugural uh, kickoff to a series that uh, we're actually having Justin host. Uh, so you'll mm -hmm. be rid of me. And uh, we have some guests coming up in the, in the next few weeks uh, that we're very excited about next Wednesday. Uh, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, we'll be interviewing and talking to uh, Coach Bobby Howe, uh, talking about the effects of COVID-19 on his coaches and players and what he sees in, in the future of, of uh, football and, and probably talk some NCAA sports future as well. And so we want to tell all of our uh, viewers that we will be sending you that information directly. Uh, but join us, uh, join us uh, each week for uh, a new version of this uh, of this uh, series. So thank you all for listening. Thanks again, Justin, and go Grizz, everyone. Indeed. Thanks, everybody.